He paid for all of the sins, for all of the people, for all of time. You know, it doesn't take a double doctoral or a master's work. I'm not poking fun at anybody. Be who God created you to be, please. Always boils down to our relationship with Jesus. That it, that relationship affects everything in our lives. God chose Israel. Our founding fathers chose God. Be a doer of the word. Because faith without works is dead, for real. That's religion, that's knowledge, that's intellect. You need to go out there and engage with your world and own your liberty. So I am going to do uh, number two of what I started last week because I literally got half of it done. And I'd like to blame someone, I've been looking. <laughs> And I don't have, Ryan, yep. <laughs> no, Clark called you out, yeah, it's okay. You know, some people like to accuse the brethren. <laughs> it's okay, it's just, it's just satanic. Um, <laughs> uh, because I really wanted to drill down on this, I really, I really want us to understand this dynamic of the Lord. Last week's message was called Master of Storms. And this week is obviously Dos, Master of Storms. Because if, if you are not paying attention, our society, our world is in a storm. Now I know a lot of people are just like blah, blah, blah. I'm just doing my thing and you know I got life on cruise control and I just whatever, I'll pay. Uh, they just invented a new tax uh, yesterday. They just released it, so there's a new tax coming. Um, inflation is a tax, in case you don't know. If you, if you don't understand what inflation is, inflation is literally on purpose the government taxing you without taxing you. Because you work and make less. And you buy less, and all of that that was lost goes to the government. Inflation is a tax. In fact, inflation is such a radical and devastating tax that inflation almost singularly was what caused Germany after World War I to embrace and vote into power communists. Because inflation was so bad, you've probably seen pictures of people in uh, 19, 1920 Germany in wheelbarrows with marks going to buy a loaf of bread in a wheelbarrow because the money had lost so much power that you, it took a wheelbarrow of money to buy a loaf of bread. And the people were so devastated by inflation that they actually voted Hitler into power because he was going to fix it. And he did. He fixed it. <laughs> Give him a war. That's how devastating, that's how satanic inflation is. And so many people are just like, oh my God, did you see the price of eggs? Again, our solution is complain. Check. I did something. Jesus is the master of storms. This particular storm that is hitting our world. Fake war in Ukraine. Man, I should have said some of this stuff before the recording started. The false flags all over. Now North Korea's throwing missiles around and you got, oh, China's gonna go into Taiwan and Hunter Biden's laptop is real. Surprise. <laughs> all of the things that I told you six months or a year ago that everybody's like, oh, Pastor Steve, conspiracy theories. Oh yeah, look now, I'm a prophet. <laughs> I, had some, I had somebody say, you know, I've watched you on Facebook for you know a year or two and he's like, I pretty much look at your stuff and then now I know it's going to happen in a couple of months. I said, well, it used to be a couple of months. Now it's like a couple of weeks. I say something, hey, this might happen. Like the Babylon Bee, if you don't know who the Babylon Bee is, I don't know if that'll get me kicked off, but the Babylon Bee is awesome. And it's a satirical, conservative, uh, whatever, social media site. And they say all these funny things like... Uh, Man wins women's NCAA swimming competition. They said it like a year ago. And then like a year later, man wins woman, and everybody's like, oh, he's Jackie Robinson. 
I got to tell you, when I seen that tweet where they compared the man abusing women, because that's abuse. If I beat a woman, whether it's at sports or physically in my bedroom, beating a woman is abuse. And, and for some reason, society is like applauding this guy, giving him awards. And when I seen the tweet that we should be celebrating this man like Jackie Robinson, I had to get out of my desk and go outside and pace. Because I got a shotgun in my... <laughs> I don't know what I was going to shoot. I just wondered I felt like gunpowder needed to explode because of what I just read. It was exploding on the inside of me. Jackie Robinson is literally probably one of the greatest men that has ever been an American and changed a nation. And to compare the two is satanic and demonic. Demonic. Man, I got to get off this subject. <laughs> I could do an hour on that. The master of storms is coming into this storm-laden society. Wars, rumors of wars. Men who don't know their men. I got. I got to get off it. <laughs> they just keep going. <laughs> it's like gravity. Inflation. Um, the government, as, as nanny, telling you what needs to happen, I, I uh, again, not to like tout me, but I, I called this 10 years ago when they came out, or whatever it was, when they came out with Obamacare, 20 years ago, however long ago, when they came out with Obamacare, I literally said, watch, America will embrace this because it's going to be cheaper. And then, and then there's going to be a time that the government is going to rule your physical, medical body. And everybody just, I mean, I got laughed out of many rooms. And here we are, mandated vaccines. They, you're only allowed certain drinks. You're only allowed certain kinds of food now. You can't eat meat. You gotta be switching over to soy-based products. And you know, if, you're, if, you're, if you're a carnivore now, you are literally part of the, of the evil terrible wickedness in our planet and you need to have organic stuff that's grown in different places and I mean it is I'm telling you when we gave it up for a little bit of money just like Caesar did in Rome just give the people entertainment and bread and they'll do whatever you want and the government came along and said hey we'll make your health care a little bit better and a little cheaper and everybody's like well you know I really don't I really don't think government health care is a good idea, but it's going to be cheaper. Signed off on it, and now the government says, hey, you're going to take this jab in your arm. I don't want that jab. Oh, really? You're going to take that jab, or you're not going to have a job. We're the government, remember? Obamacare? We're going to care for you because you can't. The master of storms has come into a society that has given up personal autonomy. They call the things of God, the spiritual things of God, like character and virtue and honor, um, punchlines to jokes. Uh, your, your popularity is now determined by the number of likes or, or non-likes you get on social media, so much so that there are young teenagers, especially girls, who are committing suicide because they are not getting the responses out of social media like they should be getting, they think that they should be getting, so they're committing suicide. We just dealt with, an, uh, I just, actually this week I dealt with two different uh, scenarios with suicides. Young people. <laughs> there is a storm in this world, and, and, and I've wrestled with this, I don't know what's worse. The folks that are just ignoring the fact that there's a storm, that's terrible or the people that are actually part of the problem of the storm. And I know I, I'm saying, I'm, I'm on purpose, like I don't know. I don't know which is worse. 
because people that are ignoring it are propagating as much as the people that are doing it. And I said this uh, about two years ago, we're in a war. There is a war for the soul of humanity. And whether you're fighting or not is irrelevant to the fact that there's a war. If you're not fighting, it's totally okay for you to be cannon fodder. That was, that's what the enemy would prefer. Just don't fight. No, no, no. Pastor's being stupid. You know how he is. He's always making a big deal out of nothing. Just like Jesus. There's a, you know, in the Old Testament, there was basically no revelation of Satan, a devil. Jesus comes along. Jesus dealt with more demonic things on a day than almost the entire Old Testament added together. Did that mean there was more Satan when Jesus showed up? He made people aware of satanic activity that was already taking place. People were defeated by Satan, demons, evil, wickedness. He just made them realize it. So I'm telling you, this stuff's going on. And you're not going to be able to ignore your way out of this. You're not going to be able to just look the other way and hope that it goes by. I'm telling you that you need to engage for your children or your grandchildren. A lot of people, they're only going to do what affects them personally. Well, if it affects my money, I'll do something. If it affects my time, I'll do something. If it affects my direct family, I'll do something. That is not... Christian. Christian is love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. How do you love your neighbor without loving your nation? This storm is here. But the master of storms is here too. Right underneath the suit coat. The angel of the Lord appeared and said, and this is to Gideon, and I keep threatening, I'm going to preach on this, and said, mighty hero. Man, every time I say it, I want to preach it because I know the story. Uh, go read Judges. Uh, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. What makes you a hero? A cape? Uh, the fact that you can pretend real good when you're a kid and fly around the house with a towel on? No, what makes you a hero is a hero living in you. Colossians 1.27, God did this because he wanted you Gentiles. I scribbled that out in my Bible and I put beloved. God did this because he wanted you beloved to understand his wonderful and glorious mystery. God had a mystery that he revealed just to this generation, this post-resurrection generation, this finished work of the cross generation, this glorious mystery, and the mystery is that Christ lives in you and he is your hope of sharing in God's glory. He is your hope. Not you, not your cool actions or your lack thereof. Not all of your amazing self-righteousness or wickedness. You don't get anything with God because you're wicked, and I know that messes with people as much as you don't get anything with God by your good works. They're both a stench in his nostril because your righteousness doesn't anywhere near compare to his righteousness. And your wickedness doesn't anywhere compare to his blood. Everything we get in this life is by leaning completely and solely on our Savior our Lord, who is the hero of the whole story. It's his story, history. And this, in this series, we're, we're breaking out this hero so that we can live a life in truth, justice, and the kingdom way. And I know that sounds corny, like I'm pulling from cartoon, but I'm telling you, truth 
is barely perceptible in today's world. Justice, justice. That's why they changed it to equity. Equity means equal outcome, which is just another word for socialism. God believes in justice. <laughs> There's a difference between equity and justice. That's why culture is changing the word to equity. It used to be equality, which means everybody was created equal. That wasn't working because it doesn't help the race wars. We need equity, which means if you are not getting the exact outcome that I'm getting, you're evil. That's what equity means. Truth, justice, and the kingdom way. Not the American way, not the world's way, the kingdom way. When we talk about the culture here at Beloved, I know I say Beloved culture, but it's a culture of the kingdom that we've embraced at Beloved Church. And hopefully you've experienced it for you personally. In Psalm 16, the Lord said in the, or not the Lord, well, God, the Holy Spirit said, the godly people in the land, they are my true heroes. You know, God has heroes. Amen. God's heroes are the one that's embraced God as a hero on the inside and they've lived their lives heroically. Man, God takes no pleasure in the destruction of his people. He, take, he takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. He wants us to be victorious. All seven churches in the book of Revelation, the Lord said one thing in common to all seven to him that overcomes. Amen. The most acceptable and pervasive sin in the church is a four-letter word that starts with F. Uh-huh. I, I, I was looking to see. Pastor's about to, no, I'm not. You're in the wrong head. Fear. Four-letter word that starts with F is the most pervasive and acceptable sin in the church. I would, I would guess that 80%, I don't know about this room, but 80% of people that call themselves Christians, which just so you know, 60% of the nation call themselves Christians. I'd say 80% of the folks that call themselves Christians live their lives in making decisions based on fear. Well, if I do this, it'll cost me this. If I say this, it'll cost me this person. If I don't do this, then this person won't like me. If I don't do this, I'll be in, it, it just, it's on and on and on. Insecurity is fear. Fear has a lot of faces. How many relationships this is, this is honestly one of the greatest joys that I've experienced in this culture is that um, I, don't, I don't have to live that way. I don't have to live in fear what people are going to do. I'm just going to be authentic. And I, I, and I have a bunch of authentic people in my life, Pastor Ryan, Pastor Bob, and just a ton of people. I could name names uh, incessantly in here. A ton of people that will say, hey, Steve, maybe a little less this, a little more of that. Okay, I'm okay with that. But there's, uh, you, we have a whole society, like God forbid you say anything's wrong with them. How dare you? You'll break them like a porcelain doll. And you may never, Humpty Dumpty will never put all those pieces back together. They'll have to see a therapist for decades. <laughs> I'm not gonna go there. The true heroes are the ones that are living from the hero on the inside, being authentic to that, and have surrounded themselves by people who are going to look at the reality of who they are and hold them accountable for that. Uh, I, I, it is such a blessing to me, and, I, and I, I know some people get irritated when I talk about K or our relationship, but I boil everything back down to relationship, relationship with the Lord, relationship with my wife. But we, we, I, can, 
I don't have any fear whatsoever in any conversation with her. Not, I can be completely wide open, naked and unashamed. And I believe that she can with me as well. Do you, you know how, how freeing that is, how peaceful, how tranquil that is to have that in a relationship? Do you know how many people, their entire relationship is guided by fear? Well, if I say this, they might do this. If I don't do this for them, um, I'll cover this. Kay and I will cover this when we get to the sex talk at the Covenant uh, covenant weekend next next weekend. <laughs> but that particular the the physical intimate part of a person of the relationship in a marriage, it is nearly one hundred percent driven by self, by fear, by getting, taking, and that is not what God intended. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. And this, uh, this four-letter word that I was talking about, I know I gave you some definitions, and I simplified this down to two. The most acceptable and pervasive sin in the church is a four-letter word that starts with F, and I think I have a slide for this. Courageous people face and defeat personal fear. Courageous people face and defeat personal fear. That's what makes you courageous. You face a fear and defeat a fear. Just facing it has the beginnings of courage. But it's not how well you start, it's how well you finish. Lots of people can start lots of stuff. Anybody start anything and didn't finish it? Okay, all right. Woo! Everybody's listening. If you didn't raise your hand, come to the altar for lion. <laughs> After. Courageous people face and defeat personal fears. That's what makes you courageous. What makes you a hero is when you face and defeat the fear that is hurting others. And others could be something like just your family. It could be your neighborhood, your society. It could be worldwide. But that's what makes you a hero. When you've actually embraced courage to the point where it's turned into a virtue and a character on the inside of you, and now you're going to use your courage to benefit other people's lives. Which, first of all, courage. Find someone that you would, and I'm not going to do this, but name me three people that you personally know that are courageous. And I'll bet you that a bunch of you are drawing blanks. And then if I was even to say, name me two people that you would consider, that you personally know, that you would consider to be a hero. If you were drawing blanks on the courageous, you're definitely drawing blanks on heroes. And that is terrible for our society. It used to be back in the day that men, generally men, were courageous. If you knew a man... There was courage. Now they don't know what bathroom to go in. Heroes were something that, you know, when you were a little kid, you just wanted to grow up and be one. I want to be a police officer. I want to be a soldier. I want to be a, an astronaut. I want to be a fireman. Why do you want to be a fireman, little Johnny? So I can run into a building and save lives. Even to your own personal hurt, I can't be hurt, I'm five. <laughs> it's amazing, at five, hero comes natural. At 35, you stay as far away from it as you possibly can in self-preservation. Whoa, 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 that's terrible over there. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Now since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, Jesus, he, Jesus, might destroy him, the devil, who, had the, who holds the power of death. That is, the devil. And free those who all their lives, all their lives, all their, this is the Bible, this is true. 
You can argue with it. You can throw stones at it. You can get angry. You can get mad at me and send me an email. But it is absolutely true. God said it. All our lives, we were held in slavery by the fear of death. And I, and I know some of them are like, well, I'm born again. Oh, and so <laughs> fear just like left your planet. You, if you, <laughs> amen. <sighs> if you've noticed over the last two years in the pandemic, how much fear was in the church? How many churches shut down for a virus? Yep. Yep. How many people wore a mask? How many people were scared and made their lives completely align and be forced into the mold of fear because there's a virus out there somewhere that can only get you when you're less than six foot? Because at six foot, it like, ah, smartest virus that's ever existed in humanity. You can walk in a restaurant with a mask, walk to your table, take off the mask, and you're safe. The virus knows, well, 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 well they walked in with a mask. So I, mm, <laughs> illegal. Yeah. On an airplane, you can sit right next to each other, but everywhere else you have to. This is control. It's slavery yeah. by fear. It would have never worked if it wasn't for fear. Yeah. We've had viruses on this planet since there's been a planet, and Adam did the stupid. He created the viruses. There's been viruses on this planet ever since. Why is the whole earth controlled by fear? Christians, pastors, pastors. I know everybody likes to pick on the pastors, but I'm picking on them. I can't. You can't. I can. Fear. I've helped hundreds, I don't, I've lost track, hundreds of pastors during the course of that fight where they'd call me and they're like, I get it, I need to open my church. What do I do, help me? And I'm like, praise God, first off, way to go bro for actually doing it. Because a bunch of them just played the, I've had so many pastors come up to me, well, you know, I mean, the Lord told me to keep my church shut. I'm like, really? The Lord told you that? Okay, whatever you say, bro. Um, but these guys would call me and they'd be humble. And they'd, okay, I was wrong. I probably shouldn't have shut down my church, but I was believing the hype and all. I'm like, bro, I got no condemnation for you. I got no shame for you. I get it. Like they were preaching some serious fear, like people dropping dead in the streets, yeah. just walking, minding your own business, and wham, virus grab you by the throat and choke you to death. And so I get it. Like, I, I mean, people were scared. I said, but here's, here's where you're at. You got half of your congregation who are mad at you because you're closed and you have half the congregation who would be mad at you if you opened. Which half do you want to build with? And almost every single one of these preachers, God bless them, almost every single one of these preachers is like, I never thought about it. Do you want to build your church with the people that are scared who want you to have your church closed? No, let them live in their fear. Let them stay at home, watch Facebook church and, and do Facebook communion or whatever they do. Let, let the blind lead the blind, they'll both fall in a ditch. But which part do you want to build with? I want to build with people that aren't scared of a virus and they're actually going to go to church. There you go, bucko. So you've already lost half your church or more, depending on how well you've been preaching. So build with the people that actually have faith and they're not scared. You'll be better off in the future. Like the Lord pruned while the devil was trying to kill. All their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death, not by death. Life is terminal. If you didn't know that, sorry, shocking. When you came out and they whooped your and you started crying, you, you were on a downhill slide. There was going to be a day, except for me and mom. We're never going to die. Outside of me and mom, and Pastor Craig is there too, so we're, we're growing. Our, our cool kids club is, is gaining momentum. But outside of 
me and mom and Pastor Craig, everybody else is dying. Okay, okay, okay. We don't have invitations for our cool kids club. Start your own. <laughs> anyway, life is terminal. And even if you don't believe after you're born again that you might uh, die again, die, die. If you, if you haven't been born again, I'll guarantee you you're going to die one way or another. You have to be born again or you're going to die. And even after that, you know, we can argue about it. So the point is, is that life is terminal. It's not the death that gets most folks. It's the fear of death. And here's what gets me. If you're actually born again, which I know most people that say they're born again or Christians or saved or whatever, like they really, it's not really real. It's just not real. That if you're actually born again, there would be zero fear of the actual death, death. Because death, death is to be with Jesus. And if you say you're born again, and you're scared about going and being with Jesus, you're probably not born again. Because Jesus is awesome. If you didn't hear, genuine Jesus is awesome. There is nothing to scared, to be scaredy cat of to go be with Jesus. It's going to be really awesome. So if that person doesn't want to go see Jesus, oh, and I know that that exists in Christianity because people don't want to go to church. If you don't want to go to church, don't think for a minute that you want to go to heaven, which is eternal church. And tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong. It's eternal church. Well, I don't like church. Why? What? what do you want? At least when I used to go and minister at the bar next to my restaurant, I'd go over there and I'd, you know, be witnessing to people. And one guy, all the time, he'd say, you know, don't tell me about that heaven stuff. I'm, when I get, uh, when I die, I'm going to hell and I'm going to have a kegger and there's going to be strippers. And, and I'm like, you know, that's not actual hell. That's not the way it works. There's no strippers in hell. And by the way, it's dark. Not dark, it's there's no light. I, I don't, whatever she's saying, I'm, I'm going to go over here to the non carnal people. It's dark. There's no light. None. You're going to be, I mean, folks in hell are going to be abused by Satan eternally and not know what's coming. Man, think about that. No, don't think about that. There's no peace. Because Jesus is peace. So no Jesus, no peace. There's no joy. There's no pleasure. These are characteristics of God. If you take God out, which is hell, hell is devoid of God. If you take God out, any of those things that you think, like, well, you know, to be a care. There's no beer. There's not even water. There's no joy, there's no happiness, there's no laughs, there's no pleasure, there's no, there's none of that. It doesn't exist. And it's forever. And I'm not trying to like help people. I don't even know why I'm talking about this. They should have a fear of death. <laughs> Maybe that's why or where I was going. But it's not death that is keeping us in, in slavery. It's the slavery of the fear of death. And I don't believe it's actually the death death I believe it's the different forms of death that the enemy wants to do to people, which is slow death. Very, very slow death. Uh, we call this a career in American language. A career, slow death over a long time, 40 hours a week. That's death. And if you got to, people get mad at me because I don't balance some of these things. I get, if God told you to do something, then do it. And it won't be death. Right. You'll enjoy it. You'll wake up every morning like me and jump out of bed. And Kay's like, amen, get him, pastor. <laughs> the slow death that, that the enemy desires for you is an excruciating moment by moment slow degradation of life because if he can kill you that way think of all the people he can take with you 
if I'm a if I'm a terrible person, if I'm if I'm slowly dying, if I'm the Amen. If I'm the average American guy, and I'm just gonna I'm gonna speculate. Maybe this ain't true. Maybe it is. The average American guy working eight, ten hours a day, doing something I don't want to do, for people I don't like, with people I don't like. So I can come home and fake it with Kay, because I'm basically tolerating her, and she's tolerating me. So I can complain about how much money I don't have and the things that I don't get to do, and then blame her for it, because she never lets me do anything or buy anything. And then I can do this day after day. Do you know how many people in my life are going to see my life, the witness, the testimony of my, my life? And then God forbid I say, I'm a Christian. The first thing they'll say is, praise God, I ain't got no Christ. Because yeah. yeah. that guy's terrible. One of the greatest witnesses, I think, in my life, and I know, I know this for a fact because people have commented on this, people see me authentically love my wife. And they know I'm a jerk. So if I'm loving her and it's authentic, it's got to be Christ because Steve stinks. See that? And if she loves me, you know that's Christ. You, you better amen. And the kids, <laughs> they love me too. That's extra Christ. The, when you're seeing those kind of testimonies, people who's enjoying life, I, I'm, I love life. Vibrant. I can't wait to do more of it. If I had more time, I would do more of it in a regular day, but I run out of day. And sometimes I get tired. If, I, I, that's a great testimony. St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel always, and if necessary, use words. Me loving my wife with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, loving my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, living, lo loving my kids, and, and being a part of their lives in an authentic way, not in a gooey, you know, weird parent way that the world's embraced now, where they're supposed to be friends. They're not my friends, my daughter. She'll never be my friend. She'll always be my daughter. She's okay with that. She needs a daddy. She's got friends. Um, to, to submit to the Lord my finances and people's watch me over years and years and years and my finances can get better. To submit my health to the Lord and I don't go to the doctor. To, those are great testimonies. I don't have to walk up on someone and tell them that stuff. I've seen the dead raised and I've seen cancers healed and I've seen all that kind of stuff. But what's better than that is people watching me quietly, silently from across the street like, that guy actually loves his wife. That guy actually enjoys life. That's a powerful witness. And if that's not part of your witness, I would just ask you to reassess your version of Christianity. They would put people to death in Roman Colosseums. They would put Christians to death in Roman Colosseums. I'm trying to not be graphic with this. They would impale them on a sharp pole and set them on fire while wild beasts would eat them. And the testimonies of tens of thousands of them singing praises to God while this is going on. I've pastored a church 10 years. You can almost not beg Christians to sing praises to God in cushy brown and whatever color, purple chairs, with coffee, free coffee and free cookies. God bless Doreen. <laughs> You're more like than me. Maybe I should start bringing cookies. <laughs> I'm going to authentically love her. <laughs> for, for us to suffer in the name of Christ, for Christ, it should be an honor, a joy. For us to go through these times in this, 
in this nation and know that we're doing it under the glory of God. If we see the darkness and we see all the misery that's out there and the, and the hope that's in us doesn't make us be like, man, thank God I'm saved. Thank God that there's a greater hope on the inside of me. You should be filled with joy, filled with peace, incessantly, never goes away. If the Prince of Peace lives on the inside of you, when does your peace stop? The death that the enemy wants to do to you is a slow, excruciating, moment-by-moment death because then the testimony and the witness of your life will malign and blaspheme God. Emotional death. Slow. Terrible. I have a slide for this. Emotional death is depression and brokenheartedness. And I can tell you I've traveled all over the country and the number one thing that people show up to altars for me to pray and lay hands on them is this. Depression, brokenheartedness, trauma from something that happened when they were five or 10 or 15 or 20 or whatever. It's it's that internal, insecure, little tiny child that just never gets over whatever it is. And they've lived that way their whole lives. And now they're clinically depressed or they need therapy nonstop, or they they need someone basically to affirm them every second of every day because they have no real genuine affirmation. That's death. It's death. It's a slow death, but it'll eventually kill you or you'll kill yourself. That's what happens. That is a version of death that we've been held in slavery through fear. The next one is destiny death. That is the death of your mission, your purpose, what God put you on this planet for. Well, I can't do this. I don't have the right education. I can't do this. I don't have the right money. I don't have the right connections. I can't. This is, I told, the, look, I'll be honest. I'm transparent right here. This is what I told the Lord when he said, hey, fight the government. I got no friends. I got no lawyers. I got no money. I got no politics. I got, I got nothing. And you know what his answer was? I didn't stutter. I mean, he didn't say it that way, but it was like, I told you to do something. Which means, like, I already know what your assets are. I didn't ask you to take inventory of your assets. I told you to do something. This, this is something that's uniquely God. When God comes to you and says something, he doesn't do that thing where he looks at your natural life and he takes, and like, well, I don't know if Steve can pull this off or not. He's like, Steve's got me. So I'm going to ask Steve to do something that's going to require Steve to lean on me to do the thing that I'm asking him to do. So all those times that that you've heard that voice to say, hey, you should do this really awesome thing, and then you say, well, I can't do awesome things. That was probably God, and then you you did the human thing. Well, I can't do that. You know what God probably would like to say? Would like to say. He doesn't probably say it. But what he would like to say is, no, duh, I know you can't. That's why you need me. Amen? Amen. Amen. Oppression, victimhood. I'm a victim, so I cannot accomplish the destiny that God gave me. The next kind of death is success death, which is failure and insecurity. You know, if you've ever failed at something, you likely have etched in your heart that you are a failure. That's what the enemy wants you to believe. You know, successful people fail. Hey, man, boy, I could preach that for years. Successful people fail. Failures are people who fail and embrace their failure. Successful people fail, learn from their failures. Insecurity. Inside lack of security. If everybody in here stood up and cussed me out and said, this is the worst sermon ever and we hate this church, I'm not saying it wouldn't shake me, but I'm telling you that I would say, Lord, I know that you called me to do this. I know this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I know I may not be doing it perfect, but I know it's not that bad. And this happened to Jesus. Go read John chapter 6. He preached, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you and you have no part of me. 
And they all said, whoa, 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 preacher with your cannibalism. And instead of doing what the normal preacher would do, it's like, no, no, you guys misunderstood me. Uh, the inflection of my voice, you didn't get my tonality. Instead of doing that, he said, I say again to you, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. And it said the whole crowd left him, and that was a mega crowd, which is probably somewhere between three and 6,000 people. Three and 6,000 people got up and left his sermon, mid-sermon. And you know what he did? Oh, Father, I preached it wrong. I'm so sorry. I must have said it wrong. Look at all the people that left. No, he turned to his disciples who didn't leave and said, y'all want to go? Door's over there. And you know they thought about it because Peter said, where would we go? <laughs> Peter's like, we're kind of jacked on this deal. Left everything over there. I, you know, we thought you were God. Like, I mean, I guess we got to hang with it, so <laughs> slice me off a piece of flesh and fill up a cup of blood. Here we go. <laughs> Amen. He was that secure. The Lord's that secure. The master of storms is that secure. Everybody says, we hate you. We hate your sermon. We hate your church. And he's like, Father, am I pleasing you? You're pleasing me, son. All right, carry on. Health, death, and we don't have to go there because we've raised up the healthiest, wealthiest, and most influential group of people in the world. But sickness and disease is on purpose slow. You know, if, it, if the first off, if the devil could kill you, just like, like that, why wouldn't he do that right before you got born again? If I was the devil, I mean, that's how you destroy God in a second. You just kill everybody before they get born again, then God has no people. It's amazing that you probably have more authority and power than you even realize that you did. But sickness and disease is to convince you to die. And think about how bad we've come in the world because it took Satan 930 years to convince Adam and Eve to die. You know why? They didn't have TV. And you're laughing. I'm for real. They didn't have TV telling them, hey, it's flu season. <gasps> flu season? Eve, did you know it's flu season? I don't even know what a flu is. <laughs> it took 930 years to talk them into it. Now it can take us 13 minutes after coming out of the, like, you, need, you know, your baby's born. They need 47 vaccines. From what? I don't know. Just start sticking them. We don't even know anymore. They're sticking <laughs> You got to sign, we had to sign waivers to not stick our kids. Yeah. Well, why can't you just take your baby home? That's not allowed. Sickness, disease is a slow, purposeful death that he wants us to get into. Relational death, separation, loneliness. You know, the fear of loneliness, think about what the fear of loneliness will make people do. Think about how they will offer their bodies. Offer their souls in, in soulish prostitution or physical prostitution just so they're not lonely. And sometimes, uh, you guys know this, I ran restaurants, so sometimes I'd see these gals, and some of these gals are beautiful gals with amazing, like, fun and, and, and smart. And then I'd see their jerk abusive boyfriends show up and it's everything I could not do to go out there and just show him how many teeth he has. And I'm thinking, girl. And it's this, it's fear. Fear will do it. But he takes care of me. No, he don't. He beats you. Yeah, but he lets me sleep there. Separation, loneliness. Well, if I say this to my spouse, they might leave me. Is it true? Well, and I'm not, look, I, I know you guys get this. I'm not saying anything to, to make people separate. That's not the point. The point is, is how much fear, how much slow death have we allowed to get into these areas of our lives that have kept us in slavery, societal death? Well, I'm not going to say that on my Facebook profile because I don't want people to think that I'm a weird, you know, wheels off conservative. Okay. So you're going you're gonna to live your life under the fear of likes or unlikes. How many people are going to be your friends on social media? 
how they think about you. Well, I really don't like to talk about these subject matters, but this is what they talk about at work, and so I just kind of join in the conversation because I don't want them to think like, I want to be part of the, you know the number one desire for most people is just to be cool. I just want to be cool. I want to be accepted by people. I want people to like me. I, want, I just want to be cool. At, at what cost? What are you going to give up for cool? I know. I lived my life that way. I was willing to give up anything to be accepted by some jerks. Because I look back now, and I'm like, those were my friends? They were losers. Economic death. How many decisions? Like, well, I'll take the jab if I don't have to lose my job. You know, there's other jobs. I can literally give you a website that's filled tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of jobs from companies that don't require vaccines, masks, or anything like that. But, but it's not this job. Oh, is that job so awesome? Well, you know, because I heard you complain about it yesterday. Well, you know, I mean, I was fake complaining. No, you were complaining. Quit it. I would love to see, this is just me dreaming, I would love to see every mother in America quit whatever job it is and be a mom and a wife, a mom and a wife. I, if we just had moms and wives in our society today, 50% of every problem would just immediately disappear. And if we had dads being dads, if we just had moms and dads being moms and dads, you could literally just take the government and throw them in the, in fact, we should just take the government. <laughs> I read this last week. I'm just gonna read through this real quick. This is Luke 8. This is the master of storms doing his thing. In verse 22 in Luke 8, now it came to pass on a certain day, Mark said it was at the evening, that he went into a ship with his disciples. In Matthew, it says that they followed him into the boat. And so he was the leader. And he said to them, 11 words. Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. 11 words. 11 words. In those 11 words were the power to do those 11 words. These disciples just didn't know it. And they launched forth. They had faith at the beginning. You notice this? Like when everything's calm and cool and the water's awesome and the boat's just right like yeah lord we'll go anywhere with you and then the wind picks up you're like uh is this part of the plan lord <laughs> and they sailed as they sailed he fell asleep he trusted them do you ever think about that you know the lord should be able to go to sleep on the inside of you and i know that that's totally doctrinal funky but I want you to get this. He should be so secure trusting that you're doing what he's asked you to do that he should be able to go to sleep on the inside of you. Man, chew on that. And there came down a storm of wind. Matthew said it was a great tempest, which is the Greek word mega seismos, which is where we get seismic, like an earthquake. So it was a mega wind earthquake. I'm good with my adjectives on the lake <laughs> and they uh, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy Stacy wants to sing the song they were filled with water and in jeopardy and they came to him and awoke him saying master master we perish in Matthew they said Lord save us Lord notice they're calling him master and Lord now Mark said, Master, in, in, the, in this version of, in Mark, it said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Dear Jesus. This is what happens. When you get into some of this fear, when you get in slavery of fear, you immediately take the Savior and turn him into the enemy. I cannot tell you how many times I've experienced this personally, where I've been attacked. And I know that all I'm trying to do is help folk. And they, uh, they got none too excited about me in Pearl City on the second time that I helped them through a citywide flood. 
the second time. I spent church money, I spent personal money, personal time. I did everything I could to go and help people, deliver food, deliver water, rescue people. I took a boat and rescued people out of their houses because the flood was so bad. I took generators, I bought this stuff. I worked incessantly. It was like three weeks where I literally seven days a week, all I did was serve the people in the flood and come and preach at the church, seven days. And it was till 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night and it was five o'clock in the morning. And at the end of all of that, the city council got angry with me because I asked them if I could have a place to store all the extra stuff after the flood. And they said, well, we're gonna give you money? Is that why you did all this, to get money? I'm like, I don't even want the money. I just want a place to put the stuff. And I'm like, man, this is so typical humanity. When you're helping someone, they're all, oh, awesome. But as soon as it changes or something happens, it's like, you're the enemy. I was just the savior a second ago. The guy that gave ivermectin three years ago, he was awesome. The guy that gives ivermectin now, let's put him in prison with his horse pace. Really, interesting how that works. Sometimes it's easy, the easiest person sometimes to attack is the one that's closest to you, and sometimes the one that's closest to you is sent there by God to help you. Man, chew on that. Lord, don't you care that we perish? Then he arose, rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. Mark said that he said unto the sea, peace, be still. And they ceased and there was a calm. They listened. Jesus talked to water and wind. When's the last time you talked to some of the things in your life? Well, that's weird. I don't want to say stuff to, to my problems. I don't want to talk to my mountain. I'm just going to sing the songs about mountains being removed. No, you need to talk to your mountain. Amen. Jesus talked to trees. He talked to wind. He talked to waves. He talked to fish. I don't know how that fish showed up with the money in his mouth, but something had to happen. Jesus talked to a lot of stuff. You need to start talking to stuff. Well, that's weird. I know that's what the enemy wants you to think. It's weird. But it's amazing, you can hit your thumb with a hammer, you'll cuss that hammer up and down for 10 years. But God forbid you tell your headache to go away. Amen. And they ceased and there was a great calm. In Matthew it says megas. There was a megas calm. In verse 25 he said unto them, where is your faith? Mark said, why are you so fearful? Fearful. Fear drives out faith. Faith drives out fear. They cannot coexist in the same space at the same time. If you're in faith, you're out of fear. If you're in fear, you're out of faith. And they being afraid wondered, saying one to another, what manner of man, master of storms, is the manner of man? For he commands even the wind and the water, and they obey him. I'm going to take you on a little journey real quick. I'm just going to read some stuff. I'm going to show you in the Old Testament because it, it gives us a shadow, a type and shadow of Christ. I want to show you something really powerful. In Isaiah 14, these are the famous verses that uh, help us understand the doctrine of Lucifer or Satan. And you'll understand when I get into this. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 9, I'm going to read this out of the New King James. Hell from beneath is excited about you. Now you know we're talking about Satan. To meet you at your coming. <laughs> Don't you know that was probably awesome for whatever, uh, for Isaiah to prophesy this? Like, oh, hell's excited about you, Satan. Take that. I would love to be that prophet. To meet you at your coming. It stirs up the dead for you. All the chief ones of the earth. It has rate, all the chief ones of the earth. Just, uh, man, I can't preach on all this stuff. The chief ones of the earth, notice they're in hell. All those super popular people that we think are cool and powerful and awesome and all that, yeah, they don't necessarily end up in the right place. It has raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. They all shall speak and say to you, have you also become as weak as we? Have you become like us? You know, when you see the devil in his real authentic authority and power, 
you're going to be a little bit disenfranchised. Your pomp, verse 11, your pomp is brought down to Sheol, and the sound of your stringed instruments, your awesome, cool ACDC back in black, they're not playing that in hell. The maggot is spread under you, and worms cover you. Yeah, baby. Take that, Satan. Verse 12, how have you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, check this out, verse 13, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. This is why it's so dangerous when you make your choices and your will above God's choices and God's will because it's directly satanic. Well, I know I should do that, but I'm not going to. That's exactly what got Satan. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. Notice Satan wants the church. Yep. There are demons here right now. I know you're thinking, well, if this was a real church, you'd be casting them out. Really? Because some of you brought them. You want me to throw you out? <laughs> Amen. I'm not saying there are people in here possessed with them. I'm just saying like there are satanic powers that are influencing people in this church. Right. Satan wants the church. Who do you think he's going to send his demons after? The people that are already his out in the world? Right. Of course not. <laughs> I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high God. Pride got him. I, notice all the eyes. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. You didn't get what you wanted. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, is this the man that made the nations tremble? Who shook kingdoms? When you see that you're going to say, this is the guy? This is the one that, that gave me a sickness and a disease? This is the one that threatened me with poverty? This is the one that, that jacked up my marriage? This is the one that made me depressed? This is the one that gave me a bad day? This one? I was scared by this one? If you have that revelation now, you don't have to have it later. If you realize, hey, you know what? He's a loser. He has no power. He has no authority. I don't have to do anything that he puts on my life. I'm going to allow the master of storms on the inside of me to master all of over his storms, and then I'm not going to have to say, this is the one? Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of the prisoners? This is the man? And so then Jesus comes in Isaiah chapter 50. And the Lord God has given me, Jesus, the tongue of discipleship. Jesus' tongue is the tongue of discipleship. For all of you that are eschewing discipleship, his tongue is about discipleship. This is why you don't understand a lot of the things that he says, because he says it to disciples. The Lord God has given me the tongue of discipleship to sustain the weary with a word. He awakens me morning by morning. This is Jesus, prophetically speaking. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. Jesus isn't just the disciple who makes disciples. He was also a disciple of his father. Think about that. The Lord God has opened my ears and I have been, and I have been made I have not been rebellious, nor have I turned back. I offered my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who tore out my beard. I did not hide my face from scorn and spittle. Because the Lord God helps me, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I will not be put to shame. The one who vindicates me is near. My hero 
is within. Who will dare contend with me? This is Jesus. Who dares? Who's going to stand in front of the Lord of the Lords and the King of Kings and say, I'll take him on? Think about it. Satan tried it. How'd that work out? Well, oh boy. Let us confront each other. This is Jesus. Boy, I tell you what, this makes my man muscles like squirm. I can feel the hair on my chest growing right now. He's like, who's going to contend with me? Come on. Come on. Go ahead and make your debt my day. I'm your huckleberry. Who, who, who's out there? What demon? What devil? All the demons? You want to come now? What you got? Sickness? Disease? Oh, death. I should be really scared of death. How about this? Lazarus, come forth. Come, contend with me. Who is it? Who's got some? I got something for you. This is Jesus talking. A little braggadocious, ain't it? No, it's not braggadocious. When you could back it up. He backed it up. Let him approach me. Come on. Satan, you think you all that? Come on. How'd that turn out? Worked right into his plan because what Satan did to get Jesus into hell was exactly what the plan Jesus needed to get into hell so he could wreck hell for you and I. Take the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Matthew 28 in Young's Literal. And having come near, Jesus spake to them, saying, Given to me was all authority in heaven and on earth. Given to me was all authority. You, anybody know what all means in Greek? All. Having gone then, disciple all the nations. So this is Jesus saying, I got all power and all authority. You go in my name, disciple nations. I got everything back that was stolen, and I'm giving it back to you. Go do what you need to do, church. In my name. Because he remembers the last time he gave all power and all authority to mankind. Satan gave it to Lucifer. So now he says, I've got all power, all authority. I wrecked it all. Therefore, you go in my name. There needs to be two signatures on every check. Baptizing them. Wherever you go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all whatever I command you. And lo, I am with you all the days till the end of the age. Your hero is with you. And backs up your words, backs up your declarations, backs up your authority, backs up what you're trying to do on this earth to make nations into disciples like he told you to do. He signs the check every time you use that authority. Yep, that's what I told him. Sign the check. Father, send the power. This is who we're called to be. This is the hero that's on the inside of you that is waiting to be unleashed on a devastated world that has a storm that's swirling, waiting for the master of storms on the inside of you to say, who wants to contend with this? Pow. You guys feel your hair chest growing? It's tingly. Amy, yeah, Amy's is. All right. All right, please rise. Please receive the blessing that the Father has for you. He calls you beloved, the ones that are greatly loved. And we, he and I both desire that you experience prosperity and his type of divine health. And the way this happens is by allowing your soul to prosper through intimacy with him and knowledge of his word. I love you and I'll see you again soon.